Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon from wherever you are in the world. You're welcome to the second uh, webinar uh, in our series of trade and development webinars uh, on Renewal Initiative. Uh, this is the second edition holding this journal. The first edition was held in uh, April. And thank you, everyone, for uh, joining. So, to start, I'll quickly say that um, businesses and trade are very crucial to the development of society and the improvement of people's uh, living conditions. Uh, so the African continental free trade area uh, went into force January 2021, uh, but we are yet to see uh, much trade on the platform and uh, businesses, especially SMEs, are yet to really benefit from a larger continental market. So on this webinar, we'll take a look at the African continental free trade area and uh, especially how small businesses can uh, benefit from it. So today I have with me three amazing speakers uh, that will help to shed light on this topic. So I have um, the political and trade policy analyst based in Madagascar. Since 2021, she has been the editor of the Continental Approach, an online African magazine with the aim of proposing recommendations to solve the various problems facing the African continent. Welcome, Val. Val. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Hi. All right. I also have with me today Jumei B. Owale, who is an economic analyst focusing especially on macroeconomic commodities, consumer and international development analysis. Uh, she is an economic consultant with Financial Derivatives Company Limited here in Nigeria and an economic analyst with Safe Business. I welcome Jumei B. once again for joining us. Thank you. Uh, all right. So I also have with me Tami Kuroye. Uh, Tami is a licensed lawyer from Nigeria and a PhD candidate at the University of Bradford, United Kingdom, uh, where he's looking into the use of digital currencies for the monetary union. He's also a free trade fellow at the Omino Initiative. So welcome everyone once again to this uh, amazing webinar. So Thank you. So we'll be looking at how small businesses can benefit from the African continental free trade area. So to start with Val, uh, I would like to ask you what the African continental free trade area is and uh, why is there so much emphasis on it? Of course, you would agree with me that uh, some people are probably not scared about the AFCFT and it's such a, a big deal now nowadays in the continent. So what would you say to that? Thank you so much. So what is the AFCFTA and... Um... Why so much emphasize on it? Uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's already 1 p.m. in Madagascar. Um, so um, the FCFTA is uh, the largest uh, free trade uh, area in the world. So it brings together uh, 55 countries, but currently um, it, um, it is, than a single market uh, that uh, um, has like 50, uh, 54 member states uh, who have signed um, the agreement. And then um, it brings together 1.2 billion people then and with a combined GDP of over $2.5 um, trillion. Um, so why is it uh, important? Uh, because um, one of the mandate, uh, I would say the overall mandate of the EFCFTA or the African uh, Free Continental uh, Trade Area is to eliminate trade barriers and to boost intra-Africa trade. So uh, we hope that that will um, advance the trade in value-added production across Africa, all sectors in the African economy. But we hope as well that this will contribute to establish um, investment to enable investment and also job creation um, in Africa. Great, great. Um, it's really a big market. Uh, talking about 1.2 billion people and, and uh, 2.5, we said, trillion dollars in combined GDP. So that's really a huge uh, opportunity. Uh, I mean, I was going to ask um, how large the, the African continental market is and why uh, 
small businesses should care about it. So, um, Tommy. Um, so, like Val rightly said, first of all, hello everyone. Like Val rightly said, um, it's the African Continental Free Trade Agreement creates the biggest um, free trade area in the world because it has over 54 out of 55 countries involved. Even Europe, the European Monetary Union does not have that size of um, markets. Um, so this means that all the natural resources in Africa, all the innovations in Africa, all the small businesses and big businesses can move and service one, other, one another within the continent without any stringent or um, fixated barriers. This is mind blowing because it means gold from Zimbabwe or from South Africa can easily be transported to a country that is needing such gold and it just facilitates um, all the trade processes. Um, so I have some statistics here on how this um, historic agreement can change the African continent. Um, Steven and Val has mentioned some, but I'll just try to reiterate. Um, so it's estimated to lift at least 30 million people out of extreme poverty and rise the income of 68 million people in the continent um, out of $6 per day. So over 68 million people will rise out of extreme poverty in the continent. Um, it also connects 1.3 billion people um, and is expected to increase um, the gross domestic product GDP of the continent to $3.4 trillion. Um, it's also that th these are numbers that needs to be broken down. But basically, it means small traders in Nigeria, small traders in South Africa, so small traders in the Central African Republic can easily have access to a central market where they can sell and um, showcase their products, as well as connect with investors, with um, people with similar ideas, and then or, you know have new customers, have new access to funding and have um, new innovations, access to raw materials to innovate their products. Uh, currently, it's not, hasn't been implemented fully because um, um, out of the 50, um, 54 countries that have ratified after, I think it's just um, 40 that have, 44, no, after the 54 countries that have signed and recognized after, it's just 44, have ratified the um, 44 countries have deposited the instruments of ratification, yeah, and only four have ratified the movement of free people because for trade to be effective, there has to be free movement of goods and services of individuals as well. Uh, and only four countries have recognized that. I think Nam Namibia recently um, removed all visa requirements for or is in talks to remove all visa requirements for Africans moving to the country. And Kenya also is planning on removing all visa requirements for everyone who comes to the country for businesses. Um, so for trade to be affected and the continental wise, there has to be free movement of people. And that's also a major problem that is trying to be, is, that is being tackled right now by the African Union and other re regional economic bodies. Um, basically, like I said, 54 countries all creating a single market, a single continental market. Just imagine waking up and having access to 54 different purchases, ideas, goods, services, raw materials. It's incredible. Africa is flustered with lots of raw materials and innovations and young people with innovative ideas and products. And after basically just brings all of them together in one platform and without barriers and access to everyone. So that's how large the market is. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement, I think it's open to all um, because first of all, the, the, the beauty of it is that um, the tariffs um, that exist with um, trade, you know, will be non-existent. So, um, Essentially, not just the small players can, you know, um, participate in the trade agreement. Um, so you think of it like cross-border trade happening without any borders, that kind of thing, right? So um, you can easily move your goods, even move in person, right, between Nigeria and South Africa or south from South Africa to Kenya, things like that. 
Um, so that's essentially what it does. So it doesn't exclude anybody, right? Um, the question now is for any small scale um, business, the question that you should ask yourself, the questions you should ask yourself is, number one, who do you want to sell to, right? Um, number two, why are you selling this particular product? Number three, what exactly are you even selling in the first place, right? Number four, how do you intend to get your goods from where you are to where to the market you intend to get to? Um, and the reason why I say this is because when you are thinking of the product that you have to sell and you think of the market that you currently exist in, have you been able to successfully satisfy this market? Or are you looking to just use the African, or is, is the AFCTA just an avenue for you to branch out, maybe not expand, but move your base from where you currently are to another country maybe because you feel like the target market there is where you want to get to so um or it's, it's, it's who you want to reach and maybe there are resources there that you would like to tap into or maybe there's a need that your product is going to address or service or so or supply you know that um, and, and, and that's why your product is even existing in the first place. So if you're able to answer all of these questions genuinely, then you can comfortably take your, um, you can comfortably, you know, um, access the agreement. But the thing now is if you're in a country like Nigeria now that even after signing, you know, and ratifying the agreement, a lot of the bottlenecks regarding trade liberalization still exist. So you still have things like custom delays. You still have things like, um, correct repatriation being an issue. You still have things around um, levies, tariffs, import duties, excise duties, a lot of unclarity, you know, surrounding all of these trade um, policies and barriers, right? So, um, until you're able, and even the big players still have to deal with these issues. So the question now is for you to, until these issues have been, you know, um, addressed, it will definitely take some time for smaller scale businesses to now take advantage or even fully take advantage of the, of the um, trade agreement. Because another thing to also consider is um, with, with free trade agreements like this, they take advantage of special economic zones, right? And special economic zones are like um, special trade areas within countries that provide all of these incentives that a trade agreement like the AFCTA is also providing. What the only difference is that it is existing within the country, right? So, and unfortunately, still again, you know, Nigeria's um, SCZs have, haven't exactly been very efficient in mitigating all of these bottlenecks that hamper import and exportation and hamper trade. So what this points to is that it will definitely take some time for um, even bigger businesses to comfortably participate in the AFCTA, more or less um, small, scale, small scale businesses. But the short answer is that everybody, you know, can have access to the, to the um, can take advantage of the AFCTA. Thank you very much. You, you highlighted the number of very important, very critical uh, issues there. Uh, I, I, I noted um, the, the issue of logistics, which is very important, because not just uh, what you're selling, how to move what you're selling to the you know, that these are issues that affects both small players and big players. Uh, there was, I mean, there's been this concern about the fact that Africans trade in um, low deep poverty goods, I mean, not manufactured goods, what most of what goes between African countries. So, you know, that's also raises an issue. But I, I want you to shed a bit more light on uh, the forest repatriation. Recently, the now, federal government has uh, liberalized the forex market. Uh, I mean, do you see this helping to uh, make uh, forex repatriations easier? Because that, that's really a big issue with airlines and other businesses. And of course, that would be also an issue for small businesses as well. Yeah, so I would I would segment the um, questions because you actually asked two. So the, so before I go into the um, exchange rate part, so let me talk about um, the ideology that it should be easier for um, small scale businesses to actually move, you know, their goods around and all of that. So in 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 actual fact, when you think of the assets that small businesses own, it's easier to actually move around. Unlike a big business that would think of, oh, um, I have a manufacturing plant 
hands here how do i actually move it you know because really those things are fixed you can't take them out of where they are so you're looking at an additional um cost of like capital and all of that so essentially when it comes to production and even movement of the factors of production you have to consider what those factors of production are so what is your capital and what exactly makes up your capital so for small scale businesses that or you or maybe it's startups for example that you you look at how they are able to raise funds and all of that you can see that their capital is a bit more mobile right simply because you have a venture capital that could give them more funds just knowing that they are expanding to another african country right unlike a big player that would have to raise its own capital you know um by itself so those are some things to consider then you also consider the the other type, the other factor of production, which is your labor. So are you planning to transport your labor that currently exists with you or you're starting a new branch of your business, say in Kenya, and you have to employ Kenyans because when you're moving into a new base, moving into a new country, you also have to consider the laws that exist for all of these factors of production and how easy it is to transport these factors of production, plant them, grow them, and also, you know, utilize them, right? So um, those are just a few things I wanted to mention there when it comes to the ideology that it's easier to, you know, move yourself because you're a smaller scale business. Just Thinking of it in terms of assets alone might be a bit flawed because you're not considering holistically the other factors of production that come into play right there. Then looking at the exchange rate um, liberalization thing. So I wouldn't exactly call it an exchange rate liberalization, but I would just say that this is a huge um, positive policy change in Nigeria's FX market. Right. So when you look at FX market, you look at it in terms of really it is a market where we buy and sell currencies. Right. And unfortunately, Nigeria's FX market has had a lot of restrictions when it comes to buying and selling of currency. Right. When it comes to the um, price and supply side, people were not able to access um, um, FX at the official rate. So that created a lot of bottlenecks and pushed demand towards the black market, black market rate. So if you want to get market, you get FX rather, you can't easily walk up to your bank, which typically is how the world runs, right? We, the world particularly runs an efficient and effective interbank exchange rate system where you can easily walk up to your bank as a small scale business and get FX at, the, at a particular rate that is very close to the black market rate, right? And really there'll be no need um, for you to access it at the um, black market rate. So essentially what this has done is, number one, it has sent good positive signals to investors, right? So as an SME that is present in Nigeria, it simply means that a foreign investor can look at the current situation or the, the um, push for um, economic reforms in Nigeria today and see you as a potential um, investment project, right? Just because it is easy for them to put their money into your business. And now it's also easier for them to get it out. Unlike before where they had issues with putting their money in and then getting the money out. Same as well with airlines as well. Same thing with other, you know, big, big businesses. So what this does is that number one, it, it allows SMEs have this um, easy access to FX. So nobody is excluded now from getting FX at the new rate that it would be, which would now be determined by demand and supply. So whether you are a Dangote or you are a um, or you are a uh, SME in Agege that is just trying to start up, you can get FX from you, you should be able to get FX from the bank at the market determined rate, which will now be closer to the parallel market rate. The other flip side of it um, is that um in in terms of in naira terms right if you're a company that you know you deal more with um fx right maybe because of repatriation or maybe your capital or um whatever it may be if you deal more in in foreign currency what it means is that in naira terms you'll be earning more right so you would have more money in naira terms to execute what you're doing because really if you're in nigeria your sales 
to the common man will be in Naira. So meaning in Naira terms, you'll be, you'll be um, having more and to also be easier for you to move, for, move funds, you know, around, have cross-border transactions. So if you're an SME looking to expand to another um, African country, so this just means that it will be easier for you to engage in your transactions, be easier for you to engage in trade. And if you now, if, if the bottlenecks surrounding the AFCT are now removed, it's just going to make it easier to conduct um business so that's that's what this and in summary that's what the entire exchange rate uh liberalization you know is uh, when she talked about mobility and uh, um, capital as well you need to consider the fact that um if as an sme let's say in um Central African Republic it's one of the poorest countries in Africa an sme who is planning to you know engage in the um, single continental market they need to consider the infrastructure if it's there if they have the finances to actually move their goods from um, car in the central african republic to other countries um, if the infrastructure is there the rules the transportation mechanisms and also the payments mechanisms to recognize or accept payments in these various countries those um, overarching um, um, should i say inhibitions restrict the accessibility of after and how impactful it's going to be for SMEs in the continent. So uh, in that regard, it's mostly the big players that can get involved because they have the spare, spare change to involve to you know transact in such a market in such a competitive space. But um, we're hoping that as the continent is gearing to a digital economy, to a gig economy, this would simplify things and make a lot of, um, create a lot of opportunities for SMEs to get involved. Val, what's your view of this uh, same issue? If small businesses uh, look at um, scaling to value chains in their local, co uh, local countries or aim to directly uh, trade on the African continent? So um, my perspective on this is that, um, first of all, um, cross-border trade will allow SMEs to access to more markets from um, beyond the national borders, which means that um, these SMEs will, uh, can buy goods and uh, services from um, elsewhere and from a wider market. And it also means that you have access uh, to more markets to buy the goods and services you might need to improve your own goods and services or to produce and supply them um, cheaply. Um, for example, um, in the case of Madagascar, let's say um, you might need uh, vanilla from Madagascar, for example, and Madagascar is the number one producer of vanilla. Um, around the world. So, for example, a South African SME would need a vanilla from Madagascar. Um, if you cannot trade with Madagascar, if the tariffs are very high, then that will mean that it will be very difficult for you to access uh, the vanilla to make a perfume and then that will have an impact to your competition in the market or uh, it will impact on your benefit, on your cost um, as well. So I think that's the, that's the advantage of it. Also, like in terms of, uh, now we know that in terms of like the, the digitization, we know that we have uh, young um, Africans who are uh, using phones and we have now like um, SMEs are trading already with each other uh, through mobile through their mobile phones for example but the problem is that this has been done in a more informal way as well so when something is informal, of course, the country cannot, some most of the time, not trace those transactions or not, cannot get taxes from them. So also it will be difficult for the country to um, provide uh, 
just public services or to to see to to see the impact of the small businesses so what would be great is the really the political will to make sure that the structure under the AFCFTA is um, can will help the SMEs to trade between each other. And um, for example, we can see uh, in terms of agricultural product, uh, for example, um, there are many SMEs uh, who are uh, trading um, in the agribusiness sector as well, for example. So if you, if you have still these like uh, non-tariff barriers or uh, the barriers in terms of trade, then it will be hard for you to export your uh, product abroad. For example, if you have excess of production and this uh, exceeds the demand um, in your local country. And you, we, we find that, for example, in the meat industry in Southern Africa. And whereas in Northern Africa, we have this problem of like people not getting access to, to meat enough. So if we have this, then um, as SMEs account for more than, I think, um, more than 90% of business in Africa, then we might help uh, supply the, this gap between the, uh, help reduce this gap between the demand and the offer um, in Africa in terms of, in terms of trade um, as well. Yeah, great, thank you. Thank you for that uh, contribution. Um, you, know, we, you mentioned the issue of logistics earlier on. And uh, I look at Madagascar as kind of a special country, you know, being kind of all the coasts of the southern part of the continent. So, I mean, how, how does your country manage logistics uh, in terms of trading with other countries on the continent? Uh, I mean, looking at for small businesses, especially uh, logistics would be a big deal for them, like uh, how uh, it should be for big businesses. It, it would be easier for big businesses to maneuver the you know, challenges around logistics. So. The problem of Madagascar, I think, is that Madagascar is an island. And um, as an island, uh, there is always this like island culture. So we are not used to trade with others, but we are learning slightly and we are afraid of others. So we are afraid of other countries um, taking over the, the market that we have. So the private sector in Madagascar is really, really afraid of the FCFTA. They see it not as an opportunity, but rather than as a threat. So that's one of the reasons why Madagascar hasn't ratified yet the FCFTA, because as an island, Madagascar will need more um, investment in terms of infrastructure, for example. And even internally, we don't have enough infrastructure to, for example, transport one product, one good, for example, the rice from one region to another region. So when we talk about exporting our rice product, our, our coffee, um, the vanilla from another country to another country, then that's still a problem. We um, also uh, are afraid that if we uh, make if we let other SMEs invade our market, then there's no more market for us, but we cannot really go into others' market. For example, few Malagasy people know about the Nigerian market. What is it in Lagos? What kind of products do people in Lagos need that we as Malagasy people can provide? Um, what, uh, there might be opportunities in Cairo, there might be opportunities in Cape Town, but if there's no political will to go and to look for those opportunities to see what are the needs in this country and where is our uh, advantages uh, there, uh, then we can competitive advantages there, then we will never know. So for us, like, 
for many Malagasy business people, Africa is a big question mark. Like, what kind of product can we um, suggest to uh, people who live in Botswana, for example, that we might have, or are they interested in our product? And, and I think that's not only the problem of Madagascar, I think that's the problems of many countries in Africa, especially the smallest ones. Great, great. Um, there's so much being, a, being, being an island uh, country. And of course, as you mentioned just now, being a, a small economy, usually when trade grows, uh, they say everybody's a winner, but maybe not uh, winners equally. Some people are bigger winners. They have larger share of the pie than others. So uh, that's, that's really a big issue. So moving forward, uh, my next question would be to the maybe. Uh, so, I mean, moving into the core of the conversation today, uh, in what specific industries, uh, you know, we, we've talked about the continental free trade and um, the need for small businesses to key uh, but in what specific industries uh, do you think small business, small businesses really uh, can take advantage of the markets? And uh, what big picture uh, do you see for small businesses across the continent? Okay, so I think that um, so there, there are three, I would say two actually, um, two main um, sectors um, that you know, the AFCTA would really, would really favor. Um, and I think that's trade and manufacturing. The reason why I think agri might be a bit out of the question, except if it is, which is still, which still boils down to manufacturing, which is high value, ma ma how high value addition, right? Um, it's because a lot of African countries are commodity dependent already, right? Mm -hmm. um, so things like coconut, rice, or, beans, yams, a lot of country, a lot of African countries, you know, already produce these commodities. So um, if anything, what we'll see there is, what, what we'll see is consumer preference towards, oh, I prefer Ghanaian coconut to Nigerian coconut, things like that, right? But in terms of um, businesses taking advantage of um, the, the, the agreement, um, I see trade and manufacturing really taking a shine here. And when I say manufacturing, I mean high value add manufacturing, right? A lot of African countries are now seeing the benefit of adding value to their ag agricultural um, products, right? So if you're, if you're setting up a small scale business or you're setting up a business at all, you should be looking at adding value to whatever um, commodity that you're producing, right? Or you're looking to sell. Why? Because um, then you're creating an opportunity for governments to even look into your um, business and probably even investors because they see the opportunity or they, they see the possibility of this business expanding enough or um, being elastic enough to absorb absorb their labor force, create jobs, um, improve their revenue. When you look at the value chain for a lot of commodities, you see that companies and countries make a lot more from finished products. A good example would be Malaysia and Nigeria, right? So um, that's one thing to mention there. Then when you go deeper into what kind of manufacturing that we're also looking at, things like um, a lot of, a lot of um, um, countries in Africa have um, a, a, a resource rich, right? So things like um, where the world is going to now in terms of like, electric vehicles and things like that. So you have um, countries investing more in like integrated circuits, chips, things like that. Where And that's where Malaysia, countries like Malaysia and Indonesia really shine, even though they are not as um, big as some African countries, but it took out time to invest in this um, in, in the value chain of, all of, of a lot of these commodities, just simply because there's high demand for it now. Um, so yeah, I guess those are some of the places that we could look at. So I, I see trade and manufacturing really shining. Um, and then when it comes to trade and manufacturing as well, it depends on what goods you're selling and what, um, um, how much of value addition you're adding to this, um, you're adding to these commodities, right? So, and then another thing to, like I said before, just to consider is what is happening globally that African countries are, you know, putting their attention on that you feel you can, you know, um, invest in or provide some 
some good uh, um, products there. So that's what I think on that regard. Now, before you go, um, I mean, for example, Nigeria and most other African countries don't yet have capacity in those high tech you know, areas you mentioned under manufacturing. And I'm just thinking, uh, is there, are there opportunities for fast moving consumer goods? Because we're talking, you're looking at SMEs here. Yeah, I doubt if there are SMEs that can go into electric vehicle and this kind of high tech. Yeah. So I'm really what's going on. What's, what's practical for small business? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I mentioned that. Um, so when I mentioned that electric vehicle, I didn't, I don't mean producing the cars themselves. Right. So there are little things that go into the production of electric vehicles. Like I mentioned, like chips, integrated circuits. It might just be, I don't, I, I, I know I've seen a picture of um, what like a, a chip looks like and all of that. So, and we have the natural resources, right. So um, um, just even, even if it's just to start the conversation and then start, you know, looking at, um, investors, you know, investing in your in your startup or in your in your small business, I think that's something that would shine, right? Um, so when it comes to FMCGs, yeah, there's always opportunity when it comes to FMCGs, and that's because people eat every day. Um, people would people need uh people people need utensils people need um detergent you know things like that so there will always be demand for for F, for fast moving um consumer goods but like i said before it still has to it still boils down to um value addition as well um for fmcgs i always tilt towards small scale businesses leveraging on volume um rather than um um value why because um, as a small scale business, people might always want to prefer the company that has always been doing it um, than, 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 than what you're going to do. So when you're coming into the market, you, would, you, you want to be preferred, right, for the value of your product. And also because you want to not have to come in with a very high price, you might want to um, leverage more on the volume of what you're coming into the market with. Um, so an example would be that maybe you want to go into the production of um, chin chin, just an example, right? You know, people people would like to to buy chin chin, but really, is that something everybody wants to have right now, considering the considering inflation across Africa? Is that something that won't people be tilting towards? Um, um, uh, um, survival now that is eating like the basic things so if you're going to even sell things like that so how how can you break into the market so I'm just putting it out there in terms of like the questions you need to ask yourself I'm not saying that oh you should go into this or go into that I'm just telling you that going into FMCG right there are a few things to consider in terms of like consumer preference people's wallets right now what what can people buy um, at the smallest price at the cheapest price possible, right? So that you're able to leverage on the volume of your sales rather than price, simply because people's income, um, their disposable income right now is lower than what it used to be. Um, so yeah, that's what that that's what I think. Yeah, for in terms of FMCG uh, um, products for F for SMEs. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, I mean, you you don't just speak to that. So I'll, I'll just quickly ask Tammy and Val. Uh, I don't know if you have any other. Uh, perspective to these uh, particularly specific industries that uh, small businesses can you know, uh, focus on can look at to take advantage of the African uh, continental free trade area. Val can go first. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. So, um, this, the, the four sectors that the FCFTA identifies as important are the um, uh, automotive, agriculture, uh, and agro-processing, and pharmaceuticals, and transport, and logistics. Um, so those four um, sectors combined are representing uh, 130 billion in goods uh, and service imports. So uh, for, for the case of the um, food production on the continent, for example, 80% of, of it is from uh, small older farmers. And um, so that means that the agriculture and agro-processing have high potential for economic growth, employment, and also inclusivity. 
and it could actually increase the intra-African trade. So that's why it's one of the um, priority of the FCFTA. Also because, the, because Africa imports about 50 billion of agricultural products per year. And um, as already said, uh, African countries have natural resources. We have the land, uh, the space to cultivate. Uh, so the objective is that by 2030, uh, the intra-African uh, agricultural trade will uh, increase by um, more than 500 persons uh, the, um, if, if actually the, the, the import tariffs are eliminated uh, in or eliminated uh, across the borders um, in Africa. Also, we, we see that most of the time our economy in Africa suffers because we uh, depend a lot on the, um, the, how the international market, for example, uh, there is a war in Ukraine and then the prices of goods internationally increase. And because we import most of our products, then we our economy suffers from that. That's easy, an easy way to say it. But actually, if we can trade between ourselves and uh, for example, Nigeria is in the top three producer of rice, um, in the continent so if actually we can trade between ourselves and that not only will increase the uh, the um, wealth of the country but also will help to um, cover the demand um, in other countries and when we talk about an island as Madagascar for example um, the agriculture for example um, the fishery and forestry that employs around 82% of the labor force um, in Madagascar to say to you that this is as a great potential to actually um, make our um, economy better. Uh, so, 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 and as an island as well, um, we have, uh, we should have like, for example, fish industries and those fish industries uh, would have a great potential for investment. And if we only we can, and there are like small companies, but also small farmers who are doing this activity, as I said, mainly like eight, around 80% are in the agricultural industry that would help um, those uh, country, those, those people, economically speaking. Um, it will um, help as well then to lead to, it will lead to stronger and more sustainable domestic uh, development. But there's more efforts to do before that can be accomplished, of course. African politicians need to uh, invest in terms of infrastructure. We need to develop as well unifying standards for fertilizer regulation, for example, and to increase um, inter-African trade for agricultural goods and um, supplies. Um, so, Everything, what is really good with the CFCFTA is that not everything has to be done in one country. Uh, when, we we, when, we talk, so when we talk about value adding, for example, the rice comes from Nigeria, it doesn't have to be, if we want to transform it into flour, for example, it doesn't have to be transformed in Nigeria, it can be transformed in Egypt. So there is this kind of uh, process of um, value chains that we can create in the continent. And that's how we can um, create uh, wealth together. We can create as well uh, direct and indirect uh, jobs. 
potentially. And I will just add one sector who has been very affected, I think, in Africa, especially in Madagascar during the last, uh, since 2020, uh, the tourism sector as well. So we know that many SMEs are working in the sector, uh, I mean, uh, small hotels, small restaurants, travel agencies, and all. So um, with this FCFTA, we expect that more people would, even not from more people, would be willing to visit other countries. I don't know how many African uh, people have visited Madagascar, for example, or many, how many <laughs> Malagasy people have uh, had the opportunity to visit other African countries. So that uh, is something that should be on the, on the agenda of each government and um, to see it all more as an opportunity rather than as a threat, say. Okay, so... Uh... I was, I was about to mention the creative and uh, uh, industry as well as the transportation industry, which Val just mentioned, but the creative industry is also um, uh, an aspect or a sector that SMEs can get involved in. And I don't really think it costs that much to make short video skits and then try to share them on various platforms that have access to other countries. Um, so that's an avenue. Yeah, SMEs can can go into and also um, e-commerce and um, digital trade. That's also a huge sector that I think is being slept on. Um, I know that the um, AFSA Commission is having a, a series of meetings and they're trying to develop a protocol for digital trade. And I think that should have been the first instance, considering the various um, technical and uh, capital issues we face in the continent. Digital trade is booming, whilst normal manufacturing, the manufacturing industry is not so growing as well because of lack of finances. So I think that should have been the more the priority rather than the other. But you know, we are here now. Um, so I think digital trade is also a, a, a big e-commerce and digital trade is also a big uh, sector. And finally, the renewable industry. Um, I, I met someone or have met a series of people who have built um, small scale dams in indiv individual communities in, um, in their country from Uganda to Kenya, just very small, didn't really take, I, I think it cost uh, $3,000 at most. Um, that's a business that a lot of people or a lot of SMEs are going into renewable energy, providing solar panels, building of small scale dams and providing alternative sources of energy to communities and, every, and everything. Uh, it, like I said, it's not as tasking or demanding as other industries and that's a sector that SMEs can jump into with after. Thank you for that contribution, Sami. Uh, so before we have questions um, and contributions from other participants, I would just like to Quickly ask you, Chami. Uh, so, what are the most important considerations uh, for small businesses in Nigeria, particularly who are high in the, you know, the continental markets? Uh, what major challenges do you think the government should, uh, you know, be resolving right now? Yes, one of the reasons why the after is, has is facing some delays is because um, regional bodies and the governments of various countries are negotiating the rules of origin. Um, and that's basically in trying to agree on what preferential treatment is going to go to what goods and how is this going to be structured um, and the standards of those goods as well. So I think that's something that SMEs should get involved in, like to understand, do a market survey before going into a market, understand the standards that are being set about a particular service or goods and try to meet up with those standards. If they say, and the processing of chicken should be, you know, should have the certification ETC and ETC and ETC. SMEs who are involved in that sector and planning to get, you know, utilize the use of the continental market should also you know, adjust to these requirements and make themselves more, uh, what's it called, amenable, basically. Um, something else they can do is also try to have um, capacity building. 
uh, SMEs can try to understand, which also falls back to the first, or it's like a fallout of the first point I made. Also get into initiatives and um, capacity building trainings to understand the various complexities of the markets, of various markets, um, rules, regulations, and how to you know, negotiate. Just because the, the continental free trade agreement creates a singular market does not mean these individual countries do not have niche provisions that for protection of their own markets and people. So um, SMEs need to get involved in training themselves to understand how to get involved in these spaces and um, trade, customs compliance, how to apply for ETC. Um, they also need to um, also need to engage actively in the supply and value chains. Like Val said, and um, just because the rice is produced in Nigeria does not necessarily mean it has to be processed in Nigeria. It can be processed in Benin, it can be processed in Cameroon and then packaged in in um, in Gabon. I don't know, it close that country to Cameroon. Yeah, so um, SMEs can get involved in these gaps in the supply chain and then you know, develop themselves from there. Like, let's say the rice is being transported from um, Ghana and it's being taken to, um, to it's the final destination in Senegal and there are countries in between. And you can say, okay, I mean, I'm in Gabon. I can help package this rice. I mean, I can help package this. I can help do this, process this. And it's in, it adds to the value chain and then strengthens the whole process as well and creates creates more jobs. I think that's a sector that SMEs can get involved in actively. Um, so um, after also provides, is trying to provide um, different platforms that would enable SMEs and uh, you know, big businesses to fac facilitate trade, uh, e.g. PAPS. Uh, I know PAPS is still a very uh, technical subject, PAPS is the payment, uh, Pan-African payment system that um, was introduced by the Af um, African Bank um, is to ensure that payments is done within the continent and does not need um, extra uh, intranational bodies um, like SWIFT and the rest. And payments will be facilitated by, facilitated by central banks within the continent with using varying currencies and, um, and platforms. Um, so I think SMEs can take advantage of these platforms, uh, like um, the simplified customs procedures, digital trade platforms, uh, to you know boost their services and all. Uh, they also need to seek advice from experts like and maybe <laughs> and uh, Val, you know, engage their services to understand the sector because you, know, you might think you know everything, but you really do not. And knowledge, uh, knowledge and services is also a critical skill or sector in that after recognizes. And so Val will be able to lend, uh, render her services to, let's say, a North African SME that will be planning to you know, branch into the Madagascar, Malagasy market. And then uh, Dunibi would also provide our services to platforms that are planning to you know, break into the Nigerian markets as well. Um, so, SMEs should seek for business support and services from people who are well entrenched. Please, if you want to make a contribution or ask a question, you have just uh, 30 seconds to 40 seconds. Uh, you can just unmute yourself and quickly do that. Uh, yeah, th th this, is not, this is not a question, just um, a, a, a line of contribution. Thank you all to the speakers. It's been an interesting uh, conversation on how SMEs can benefit from um, after. So I think that one of the challenges that SMEs have anywhere in the world, if you ask, is um, you know, access to capital, access to more funds. So I think that aside from ratifying and implementing um, the trade agreements in, in different countries, like the case of Madagascar, we still need to um, ratify and implement. Uh, as we need to um, ensure so that the government implements the trade agreement and at the same time um, create initiatives that support SMEs, you know, by maybe creating uh, access to credit facilities for them so that uh, more businesses can take advantage of this African single market. Um, in addition to that, 
I also think that uh, on the side of the SME, I think there's, there's an information gap, um, as Val said, and there's a need for more uh, Nigerians, not Africans, basically, to be well informed uh, market, which, which, is, which uh, brings a huge opportunity to uh, you know, all the 54 participating countries. So as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, anywhere in Africa, you should stay informed, ensure that you stay up to date on um, the updates on the development of the trade agreement as that is how you can tap into the opportunity. Um, that's just uh, my contribution. Thank you for the interest. Great, great. Thank you very much for that wonderful contribution. Okay, in the absence of any other question or contribution, I'll just quickly like to take, you know, one one or two sentences from each of our speakers on the topic of conversation so far. Um, I'll, I'll be starting with the lady, then uh, Tammy and then Val. Yeah, um, I think my one line now would just be that um, whenever your country, wherever you are, decides to, you know, start making progress towards the after, just, you know, begin to ask yourself the right questions on how you can participate and then take advantage of it. Yeah. Uh, through today's webinar and uh, what I will say is that the success of the FCFTA depends a lot on political will and um, also on um, giving people the right information uh, so I would encourage people to dare to bring their businesses to another state and not just focus on the on the on the national market as well um, we need to think big and uh, it will be for the best for all of us but the, it's true that we that the, the the it's still a long way to go but i think that we can uh, make it happen, and I'm looking forward to the to seeing the success of the AFCFTA. Uh, hopefully, there will be more countries who will ratify, and we will have more faith on the AFCFTA in the coming years as well, and that all the negotiations will um, be fruitful as well. Thank you. Well, my final statement would be. Um to all small businesses that are trying to get involved. The journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. Very cliche, but very true. Everything you need to grow your business to venture into the continent um, is within the continent as well. Just be open, do your research, find out, get more information, get access to people who can guide you and get involved. That's simply it. Use the digital platforms as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, you have a great day.